there, and thank you all of you and those uh, remotely connected. It's a great pleasure to be in Orissa for the first time for me. I have heard uh, many good things about the efforts that the uh, government here is making. It was very pleasant landing here yesterday evening. And uh, today, you see uh, how interestingly uh, you know, curious people in the government are that they have a system of listening to people who visit or who bring some different experiences. And that's already very progressive, I think. Um, listening is as important or more important often than speaking. And that's why I remember in my college we were to form a speaker's club and I somehow uh, pushed the proposal that we should call it listener's club because speaking happens but listening is what often doesn't happen. So I'm really happy that uh, there's such a receptivity to ideas and experiences in the government here. I'm happy also that uh, my colleague Gitanji, who uh, leads the alternative university, happens to be from this state, and uh, to be with her in this state was uh, even more interesting. So, I'll share a little bit about our journey in education reform and then working with youth to solve problems of the region not as a separate thing from what happens in schools, but as a part of the process that is called education, to apply it to real life and to make life better for people. That's what uh, our work has been in the last Innovation as part of the education, which is then directly applied to make a difference in the lives of people. Now, Ladakh is a very, very different place when it comes to the topography, the geography, the climate, culture, and everything almost, uh, compared to the rest of our country. Our country is a tropical, generally, country, and Ladakh is almost a polar <coughs> climate. Uh, so, I think the help of some images, as they say, pictures speak more than your 1,000 words. So, to bring home what I'm talking about uh, and to share the story of how we try to bring reforms in the education system, which was in a very dismal state, and then we struggled and took it forward to some uh, status. Uh, I'll share with some uh, images, as I said. Yes. So, before you, the screen with uh, Ladakh has a place that is on the uh, uh, We are top north of the country, flanked by Tibet and China on the east, and Pakistan on the west, and Central Asian Republics on the north. And it is not the Himalayas, it is actually beyond Himalayas. Himalayas are very lush and green, but we are on the other side of the Himalayas, which is called the rain shadow, and therefore things are very, very different and dry, uh, like this. So, you can say that on the other side of the Himalayas, nature has left us high and dry. Hmm? <laughs> with, <laughs> with precipitation as little as 100 millimeters because monsoon clouds do not make it across. Very few. So it's a desert and uh, for a reason it is often called the moon land. Not a great compliment. You know, we would rather like to be earth-like than moon-like on the planet Earth. But anyway, that's how Ladakh looks and uh, if you look closer, this uninhabitable looking uh, desert, which almost looks like moon, has these oases of greenery, which are all man-made. And that is to say that this is one place where human beings have added to the richness of nature. Our forefathers developed and mastered the technique of 
using fossilized water from thousands of years ago because we don't have any rainfall to use much. So it is all thanks to the glaciers that store the water from thousands of years that melt every spring and those uh, that is channelized by carving the rocks and then bringing it to any flat desert where these green oases were created by our ancestors. So I feel great to see this innovation of the ancestors without which our life wouldn't have been possible in a desert like this. Anybody who is approaching Ladakh by air would say life shouldn't be possible here, but actually it thrives not only survives but thrives with a colorful civilization that has its own literature, music, dance, uh, festivities, spirituality and a life in tune with nature. So we have more than survived for millennia in these mountains. But yes, we are a very tiny minority, not only ethnically or culturally, but even climatically, environmentally, we are a tiny minority. So things that may work in the plains do not work there. And you can see how just running at that can be a circus yeah? in the mountains. Uh, people are trying to heat the pipes that are blocked because of freezing, so uh, it's very different. But this is not to say that you cannot run taps. You cannot run taps with technologies that only work in New Delhi. When copied and pasted to 3000 meters, they don't work. And half the time they don't even work in New Delhi. So <laughs> how can you expect it to work in minus 30 degrees? So our effort has been to actually find solutions to our problems in the high mountains ourselves. Because we don't expect our solutions to come from New Delhi or New York. So we'll have to do it and education is the medium to uh, arouse and interest young people to find solutions. But being a tiny minority as it is at its worst when it comes to education of little children. This copy pasting business hits us hardest, not with the taps, but much more with, say, education. So when you copy a curriculum and a textbook from New Delhi or Srinagar and paste it in Ladakh, it's a disaster. It used to be. So when I came face to face with the education system here, I saw 95% of the students failing every year repeatedly, repeatedly. And on top of that, the system would blame the children for being dumb, mediocre, almost retarded. And there were some teachers who would come from across the mountains from Kashmir or Jammu because we didn't have enough. They would say, you Ladakhi children can never do good in maths, you don't have enough oxygen in the air. Now what do you say, what do the children say, poor children, when they are told you just can't do well by their own teacher and there is not oxy enough oxygen, so they might as well give up whatever they were doing and that's what they did and that's why the results, 95% failing every single year. Yet no one really introspected in the system, because when 95% of products fail, it is the system that needs to introspect them. That's what I was forced to do and I saw amazing things like copy paste, as I said. I would see children in minus 20 shepherd communities on at 4,000 meters, 12, 13,000 feet, memorizing F for fan, F for fan, you know. A for apple makes sense. Apple makes A little clearer. A is abstract, apple is concrete. Good example. B for ball makes sense. But in minus 30 when you say F for fan, children repeat. They don't know what this 
contraption is. And if you ask the teacher, he says, I also don't know. I'm told it keeps you cool. And the children go, why would you ever want to be colder than what we are, freezing in this minus 30 degrees? So that explains why they were failing, that it was not a problem with them, but with the system. So I came across this situation by a happy accident. I had some financial problem uh, while doing my mechanical engineering. And I had to earn to support my education. And to do that, I knew no other skills. So I went and taught math and science to 10th grade students. And I knew they would fail by hundreds and thousands. But what I was surprised, shocked, was that they were so bright, so enthusiastic, so good at grasping all concepts when explained in the way they understand. And that there was nothing wrong in the students, just that everything was against them. And therefore, after I taught to support my education, which was actually a very successful uh, entrepreneurship experience for me at 19. When I went back to Ladakh to teach, thinking I need to finance my uh, engineering expense for that year by teaching in that year's uh, vacations, I went and set up a coaching institute. Somehow it picked up and the methods I used were very popular and so many students came and it was so cheap that it was huge volumes and I devised ways to deal with volumes with very interesting peer-to-peer -peer teaching where bright students would help the weaker ones. The uh, weaker ones would get help but the brighter ones would get even more help because they would become stars. You don't really learn something until you have taught somebody. So that also worked in favor of them and uh, students did better and I did very, very well. In two months, I had earned enough for four years of engineering, not just one year. By today's standards, it would be like four lakh rupees in two months for a 19-year-old. Now, that was a big turning point in my life because it, I would say in today's parlance, demonetized me. Yeah? <laughs> it rid me of the craze for money. I could see that you can earn in two months enough for four years. There are more interesting things in life to do than just chase after money, which is what most young engineers are obsessed with. So I am so happy I got rid of this craze and started thinking, how can I do something more interesting, more impactful, you know, giving back to the students. So went through this realization at that age that life is not about just what I need but also what needs me. And needing me were these uh, students who had nothing wrong with them but a system that kept them shackled. So I started planning not to join the long queue of engineers waiting outside employment exchange offices but rather do something to change this system which would unshackle so many bright farmers, engineers, journalists, leaders, astronauts and what not. So therefore I decided and uh, went back to Ladakh and there I started meeting many young people, like-minded, who saw the problem and wanted to change and after few experiments to prototype our test, we launched a movement called Operation New Hope, which was a collaboration between communities in the villages, state government, the education system of the government, because that's where most children are. And have, we have always valued working with the government education system and improving it rather than opening parallel private institutions, which are good for pioneering experiments to stretch the limits. That's where private uh, entities can play a role. But to have the mainstay of education in private schools is not a solution because 
government has a responsibility towards every citizen who can or cannot afford, who may be urban but mostly rural, where privates cannot uh, reach out. So we have always believed that government schools have to be good. And a nation where government schools are good will be a great nation. Yeah? Other initiatives are great for experimenting, exploring, stretching limits, but the general foundation of good education should come from the government and therefore the government had to be partners. So in every village we wanted to go into the primary schools and bring changes there. And civil society organizations like our own, we named it Students' Educational and Cultural Movement of Ladakh or SECMOL and that started these initiatives. So what it uh, involved was prototyping in small schools. So in early uh, 1990, 91, we started initiating um, some experiments and then we approached the government who were very, uh, not very, you know, outgoing for it. They were very suspicious. What is this? You are changing our system. And we were, you know, 21 year old. We couldn't go and say, we'll change the system, you know, they say, get lost. So, we didn't want to go high up in the government. We just went to one little school in a village and took that as a prototype so we can experiment and fail if we fail on small scale. So, we went to this one village and our idea was to approach not just a commissioner or a minister and tell them that their system is wrong and we'll correct it, but rather make some uh, real prototype and have people interested. And once people are interested, governments respond more because that is what democracy is. So therefore, before doing anything, we started working in one school and in that school, we would organize the people in the village to take ownership of their school. Normally, government schools were like nobody's school. There was no engagement of the people. There was no scope for engagement even. Uh, so we got them organized as village education committees who would take ownership, who would be like the board of the school. And then uh, we started changing the textbooks. As I said, uh, as per fan doesn't make sense at 3,000 meters. So we started changing it to mean more to the local environment. Similarly, teachers had no training. They were 10th grade and they would be teaching. So we started training them, not just in the curriculum and the uh, you know, activities, but also the context and the spirit of making it more engaging and lively for the children. Now, after this one school was very uh, successful, the teachers were happy, the children were happy, the people were happy, that's when we thought more people could be involved and then we would go to higher up in the government. So, how to scale up? From one prototype, we wanted to scale it up to all government schools. Now, for that, you need to generate demand if there is no demand among the people for education. One dilemma is that village people are, you know, they have so many other concerns that education is unfortunately not their priority. So, how do you raise education in their priority list? Because only then it would rise in the priority list of the leaders and only then the bureaucrats. So, there is a system that works in democracy which I will share, which is what we banked on rather than directly going to a minister or a commissioner. So, to make it a popular, you know, movement where education becomes a high priority, we had no means, we had no funds, we had no experts and uh, to engage consultants or PhDs would be way beyond our means when we were 20, 21, 22 year old. So, we did something very different. As our partners, to scale this idea, tested in one school, up for many schools, our partners, what we call, were the Ants Army. Ants Army, helpless, hopeless creatures 
who when they join hands when become a mass can change a lot so our ants army in this case was the so called failure which the system produced in hundreds so they were all you know down and depressed young ones who had failed so would see no hope we would get them energize them train them and take their help in making people's priorities change so there are things which experts and you know uh, scholars can't do which 10th grade failures can do better and that's where i really like this couplet um, by rahim rahiman dekh bade na ko lagu na dije dari jaha kaam aave hai sui ka kare talwari तो जहा काम आवे है टेंथ ग्रेड फेल का करे पी एच सी दैट वॉज आर आइडिया सो वी सेंट आउट ब्रिगेड ऑफ एंड आर्मी दीज यंग वन हु ट्रेन दम सेल्व इन स्किट्स एंड स्ट्रीट थिएटर एंड म्यूजिक एंड फोटोग्राफी एग्जिबिशन एंड लेटर films and videos and so on they would go out in the villages and engage with villagers that would give them something to do a cause and give them hope and bring them out and bring the best in them many of them became leaders later so win win for everyone so they would go out in the villages and do very uh, provocative theater to ask the parents what is your role in the failure of the children can you only blame the children can't you hold the priority of education in your life when ministers come when leaders come how many of you ask for education for example so such things and uh, experience of this one school that did well would be shared with others that change is possible if one cannot can do why not you so photography exhibitions films and videos etc down to the farthest villages the last villages you know on the borders with tibet china the nomads who produce pashmina uh, wool and keep sheep and goat our children would go there the students every part of there is hardly any part where they wouldn't go walking for weeks uh, trekking and it was all people centered people centered many would ask us why do you go after people you want to change the schools go to the schools why these people but we had a reason why people and the reason was this we always saw that things don't happen in isolation the child crying symbolizes the system failing they are failing so they are crying but normally people blame the teacher the next one the teacher for you know being bad being this and being that and incompetent and so on or at the most the officer above that they don't go beyond that they can only see the next school but then to the villagers when they would have their training we would use this depiction which is an adaptation of a local buddhist painting called thangka painting depicting the cyclic existence of life wheel of life it's called so we try to show how the chakra of democracy ku chakra and su chakra work and in this ku chakra what you see is that the children fail teachers are blamed or bureaucrats are blamed but they don't even look at the rest for example there they don't see what they themselves are doing the people the villagers they don't see that they are all running after subsidies doles rice kerosene water and no one is asking for education electricity kerosene is all they are asking and when they ask for that the leaders who become their voice are only talking about those things subsidies kerosene you know rice and so on when that happens the bureaucrats who take care of education are not even talked to you are running after those who are delivering subsidies and kerosene and so on the teachers are demoralized and the children fail and few that have children in the government schools remove them and take them out and the chakra is worse and worse so 
these young ones go would go and tell the people that the problem is not with the child not with the teacher not with the officer it's with you it's your priority where things change in a democracy so if you go from rice and subsidies to change in education as a long term change for your children then suddenly you see leaders talking your language talking about education when the chief uh, the officers handling education get a hearing get attention and the teachers doing well are rewarded not doing well are question and suddenly things improve as things improve people have more faith in the system and more children come more people is engaged and there is a suchakra and this is why people were important more than teachers of school and our attention was always to change the priorities of the people we may get a very favorable and lightened commissioner or a minister who would have told us that we'll change it for you why do you go to the people you make it easy for yourself i'll change it but the day that commissioner or the minister is changed things might go back or even worse so this way it cannot whatever party comes the people's priorities will still hold so that was our um, strategy using democracy and changing things and thanks to this thanks to this when ladakh got its hill council set up uh, our autonomy in 95 in 96 itself they declared education as the top priority there is hardly any government in our country who have declared education as the top priority but they did they did not because or not only because they were enlightened leaders because enlightened leaders you find many but if you make education the top priority people will boo you out so you have to have a people that is receptive to that which we had prepared for them so they took education as the top priority and this concept operation new hope as the policy of the government of the hill council and then with this lot of things changed we got to train all the government schools and villages village education committees they would come and go out without waiting for government you know repair the schools which would be dilapidated like this into this with no funds no waiting from initiatives from the government people would contribute in their own ways carpenters would make these tools so that children are not disconnected from their life and so on similarly people donated labor and built schools that were as good as private schools in the remotest parts of ladakh solar heated built by the people themselves and therefore sense of ownership and so on and teachers were all trained trained not just in maths and science but also you know the sense of uh, responsibility to introspection meditation and thinking about how you know children get affected from their uh, work lives get affected making them come down to level of children uh, making it engaged and practical for example worms are better watched by the screen side than in the pages of textbooks and from books like these which made no sense in ladakh you know mr bell mrs bell all these were the textbooks we would have in ladakh and children would shiver to look at that girl in minus 30 <laughs> so we would change change the textbooks to something like this where they would see one of them at the farm valuing the work that they see around them and not feeling inferior you know because they don't have a kitchen like the textbook shows from delhi so things like that and it would uh, enlighten them about the local history uh, through stories of the place animals would be immediate wild animals in the mountains it was all about from known to unknown of course they should know about the rest of the country and the world but start with local then go global start with the known then go to unknown and similarly science would be about how to live comfortably in a place like ladakh with solar energy and with these all put together results started changing too from as you see from 5% 5% it started slowly going up and up and 
came into the 70s. Yeah? So the failure rate went down slowly and slowly. Yeah, but I'm more happy about the science that it proved. The science that it proved, I always jokingly say, was that the problem was not in the oxygen in the air. That's what it proved, yeah? That it was something in the system more than in the air for the children. So then we came to the thought that actually no one is a split failure. Even now, when 20 to 30 students fail in 100, that should not be acceptable. Why should we give up on them? So let government take over the system. We should focus on those who still fail. Those who still fail should not be failing. You know, after spending a precious quarter of your life in something called school, you should not come with a stamp of failure on your forehead. So therefore we started a new initiative on a desert in the middle of really nowhere. For three kilometers there is no life around this. We went with a batch of some 20 10th uh, grade failures and went to create a school that would be very different. And in the next five years we created this school which was very different from all other schools. To begin with, yes, the admission criteria here was not distinctions and marks, but that you have failed in the system because it was for those who failed. So therefore, uh, why uh, failure was a criteria? Because it was for them. And also it was a learning opportunity for adults, grown-ups like ourselves, to see how we can live in harmony with nature yet comfortable. We don't have to sacrifice the planet for comfort, so-called comfort. So, this is a campus which has been completely solar powered, off-grid, zero energy since 96, when these terms were not even coined. And it is completely built with mud or earth, natural material which does not affect the environment and which is so economically affordable that it is right under your feet and the sun, powered by sun, which shines right over our head. Rich or poor, rural or urban, you find earth under your feet, you find sun over your head. And if you make the two meet with human resource, then you live happily ever after, like in fairy tales. So, the children had to design this school and build this school and thereby use all the, the abundance of energy that teenagers have should be put to use and make them partners rather than problems to solve. So they designed the school. This was a painting made by the children together after a workshop in 1994, I think. Yeah. And then based on that, that school was built. And this was a school where students would play the most important role. So they run the school virtually. And they run it like a little government, little country with a little government that has elections every two months. And the new government takes over, plans the two months that uh, they have to take care of, and then executes, and then presents before the parliament is, in, is answerable to them, and thereby learn the life skills by living life. And the responsibilities they take, the new government takes, are not mock, they are real life. So some of them would take care of all the cows, <coughs> others would take care of all the solar gadgets, the gardens, <coughs> the powerhouse, the greenhouses, and they would at the same time relate it to the textbooks. Like the, those growing vegetables would sell their products to the campus kitchen at a selling price, work backwards to find the cost price, and practically learn that profit is equal to selling price minus cost price, yeah? rather than a formula to memorize. They would apply uh, like germ theory, microbial theory on fruit preservation, making jam, etc. And then some of them would take it forward to make it into their career through entrepreneurship and so on. They would have startups. So some of them actually supply pulp and jam to industries in this country. Others have uh, started travel companies which are uh, unique in themselves. Yet others adding value to products from their region. So likewise, uh, innovations are a part of the life at this campus, uh, revolving around earth, sun, ice and fire. Sun, earth as I said, the buildings are all built with earth. Sun is used to 
do almost everything here is done with solar energy. And yet, when we started with these things, when we were building with earth, people used to laugh at us. You are taking us back in the past, you are going backwards, why build with mud? Now is the time of cement. And we saw nothing wrong with earth for a climate like Ladakh and everything wrong with cement actually. It's so cold, people can't live in cement buildings, so polluting, yet people laugh. But if you stand by your conviction, then the world catches up. So sooner or later, the world understands. So in the 90s, we would be ridiculed for doing these things. By 2016-17, the world actually started catching up. And in 2016, for the same earth buildings, we were given the uh, World Terra uh, uh, Earth Buildings Award at the World Earth Congress in Lyon, France. So if you stand by your conviction, the world catches up. Similarly, for the solar and other energy systems that we designed into the architecture, we got the Global Award for Sustainable Architecture in 2017 in Paris. So don't give up uh, the new ideas that come. If they are sound, then they are sound. Even with the minority of one, right is right. And even with the majority of 99, wrong can still be wrong. Uh, similarly, we uh, have been of late working with the water solutions. Um, you may have heard of ice super. As the natural glaciers are melting away, we, together with my students, started building artificial baby glaciers, thereby freezing the stream waters which flow in winter, wastefully, because no agriculture happens in winter. And in spring, when all the agriculture happens, there is not enough water, because the glaciers are too cold in spring, early spring, and they are too small now as glaciers are melting. So springtime there are water conflicts. So why not freeze the winter water till so that they melt only in spring? This was something we did using a simple chapter in science um, with you know physics, high school or middle school level uh, science. So what we used to do this was uh, simple gravity. This is a typical Ladakhi valley. You can see the stream going down from right to left. You don't have many resources in the mountains, no electricity, no powerhouses, but we have gravity. And often we don't see what we have. So gravity is amazing. So what we did was put a pipe upstream and bring it downstream, that is gravity. And the pipes, according to primary school science, the inlet and the outlet will want to be at the same level. Water always maintains its level. So if your in outlet is much lower down on a desert where you need water, then there will be pressure in the pipe. And with that pressure, you can start a fountain without any pump, no electricity, no bills, no pollution. And the fountain will spray water into the air, minus 20 air, thereby water will lose its heat, latent heat, if you remember your high school science. So when you use latent heat, liquid becomes solid and the water becomes a cone. Uh, this one is seven stories tall and it contains million liters of water. Now the shape of this cone is such, now it connects to uh, middle school geometry. Shape is such that its surface area is minimal and the volume is maximum. You know, in geometry we learn some surface shapes like spheres and hemispheres have low surface area and high volume. Why are we worried about surface area? Because sun needs surface area to shine. It doesn't care about volume. But farmers need volume for their farm. They don't care about surface area. So this is one shape in geometry, uh, one of the few shapes where surface area is low and therefore we thought, we hypothesized that this may melt much later in spring. We didn't know how long. We had bets at our school when we prototyped it. Some said, March, by March, all natural ice is gone. So maybe this will last till mid-March. Some said, end of March. The wildest was early May. But this cone, our hypothesis was proved when it lasted till August 6th. Yeah? slowly melting and giving its water when people need water the most. And with that, we planted 5,000 trees in a desert that has never seen any greenery, all irrigated in those critical two months 
by the ice stupa, by the water from the melty private glacier, <laughs> little glacier. <laughs> then we made more. Uh, this, these carry 3 million liters, feel 30 lakh liters, uh, and uh, it overpassed the Guinness World Record anyway, that's not so important. So this is how it would uh, water the trees that were only thanks to this water. And then it became popular in the villages. We started having competitions among young people to make ice supers for solution as water and to keep the young people busy in cold winters, you know, adventure. So some of them started building huge ones, much bigger than anything we built. The one you see is half the height of Kutub Minar and it contains seven, la seven million liters yeah, of water, which was released in spring for the benefit. And then people in various valleys, even in Switzerland, they started building these glaciers. And some of them were so innovative, they started ice cafes inside the ice supers. So tourists would throng and win them the money they needed. So it was experience for the tourists and water for the farmers. Others started ice climbing, like rock climbing, ice climbing and charging tourists and thereby financing their water solutions. For this, we got the Rolex Award for Enterprise, uh, which is not important, but what was important that it came with a handsome amount of money, roughly one crore, and a lot of publicity, and we thought those are not important also unless we use it to spiral to another level. So we said with the publicity and the money, let's start an initiative which will make such solutions part of every young person's life if we make it into an alternative university, which tomorrow becomes perhaps mainstream. So we started a project to make, to start a makers doers university, which we call now Himalayan Institute of Alternatives, which Kitanjali heads. And we are doing it by turning this desert here, hopefully into that oasis where the university will be hosted. And to do this, we launched a crowdfunding campaign throughout the world, where people could support with whatever they can, 500, 5,000, 5 lakh, because we wanted it to become a people's university. So before approaching government or approaching corporate, we wanted it to be a people's university. So even children in schools, uh, one in Delhi raised 2 lakh rupees, you know, his own campaign, an 8th grade student, and that is much more important than some crore rupees from an industrialist, you know. It is as if the child is saying, I want a university before I get ready for that. Try and end with uh, the latest of our initiatives. Uh, it's called the I Live Simply Movement, yeah. Because uh, we make artificial glaciers, so what? We make it in a little valley. We make solar heated buildings or a school that creates children who will do some climate stewardship, but our sort of problems are not going to be solved there because our problems do not start in Ladakh. It ends in Ladakh and we try to solve, but they start in big cities of the world. So unless people in the big cities change their lives, people in the mountains can't change much. So therefore, we started a new movement just recently called the I Live Simply Movement. Have any of you heard about this or seen a video? Can you raise your hands just to know how many it has reached? So maybe not, it has not reached so many. So this is a very interesting crowdfunding campaign where you contribute, but luckily for you, not in money, huh? but contribute in pledges to change your lifestyle so that climate change is not as severe as it is in the mountains where we keep seeing flash floods and droughts every alternate year. The answer to that is change in big cities. So therefore, appealing that change, we launched on 2nd October, Gandhiji's birthday, a campaign to appeal to the world to please live simply in the cities so we in the mountains can simply live. Yeah? That is the appeal to all of you and we hope you can pay to this drive with your pledges. It can be pledges like, for example, one could say I'll use stairs and not elevators. 
you cannot imagine the amount of electricity you save and the amount of fitness you gain by doing that and that finally is a contribution to us in the mountains who face blast floods you could contribute by choosing trains instead of aeroplanes an aeroplane one hour produces per passenger 300 kilograms of co2 that devastates us in the mountains but train 25 kilograms 25 to 300 that kind of difference and if you think i look a little shabby i would rather look shabby than the planet so i have pledged to never iron my clothes because one hour of ironing is the same electricity as used by a rural household for four days for lighting and therefore we stop the pollution and the coal mines and the so on so similarly you can pledge and contribute to this so i will not take more of your time by showing the video on i live simply but i want a pledge from you that you will watch it on youtube on your own yeah pledge and if you don't watch your grandparents will fall sick, your, all, all those things you get on WhatsApp will happen to you. If you don't <laughs> look for, I live simply with you on YouTube, <laughs> you will develop skin disease and so many things will happen to you, okay? So that's the contribution you can make and in there we say how you can contribute, how you can pledge and the website at New Year, when the whole world makes resolutions, will translate into dollars and we hope this Indian movement, which goes global, will contribute trillions of dollars of environmental service by not doing the wrong things and by doing the right things like planting trees or going vegetarian. All these things amount to a lot to the planet and this is what we have just launched but you have to watch it on your own thank you very much and any questions are most welcome thank you thank you thank you, thank you.